So we are fortunate to have with us today uh, Dr. Jennifer Foreman-Orth, an environmental biologist, as well as Astra Perkins, our spotted lanternfly survey lead. Both are with the Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources. And so we are excited to have them here today to talk to us about a spotted lanternfly update from MDAR. And then Jen will speak to us again after the break about some other invasive agricultural pests of importance that we should be on the lookout for. So thank you both so much for being here with us today. And I'll, I suppose, pass it over to, to Jen. Thanks, Tony. Are you, can you confirm that you're seeing my first slide and not my PowerPoint window? Correct. Thank you. Things were being a little blinky and I just wanted to be sure that we were in the right spot. Uh, all right, everybody, let's get started talking about spotted lanternfly in Massachusetts. Spotted lanternfly is what we call a true bug. It is in the insect order Hemiptera. Specifically, it is in the Fulgorid family of plant hoppers, which we call the, the Fulgoridae, and its scientific name is Lycorma delicatula. Spotted lanternfly is an invasive sap-sucking insect. It has piercing or sucking mouth parts. You can think of it kind of like a straw. And its main host is Tree of Heaven, but it also attacks grape, black walnut, maple, and hops. That makes it a pest of significant negative agricultural impact in our state and other states where it's been found. A fun fact about spotted lanternfly, although I get that it might be a fun fact for nobody but me and maybe Tawny, if you're a bug nerd, uh, you appreciate that there were no pl plant hoppers in the Fulgority in Massachusetts or anywhere in New England until spotted lanternfly showed up. So it's the only representative here in its entire family. This is the life cycle of spotted lanternfly. Right now we are in the egg mass stage, right? That makes sense. Even though it is a crazy 60 degrees out outside of my house right now, it is still winter and there are very few insects that are active. Spotted lanternfly is around only in the egg stage. It will remain in its egg masses until about May or June when it will hatch and then go through four nymph stages or we call them sometimes instars where it basically becomes slightly larger versions of its wingless self over the course of the summer and then around mid to late summer it will molt from its fourth instar which is a very brightly red colored instar with white and black spots into its adult form and then it will live as an adult feeding mating and then the females lay eggs and then die off when a hard frost occurs at the beginning of the winter here are some pinned specimens of spotted lanternfly just so that you can have a more realistic view of what these insects look like in the adult and nymph stages versus the cartoon in the last slide and here's a more detailed list of the host range of spotted lanternfly. <clears throat> when we first were hearing about spotted lanternfly, it, it only, and I'm using air quotes, only was thought to have 70 different species that it would feed off of, but it, that list has been expanded to over 100 different species of trees, shrubs, vines, and even herbaceous plants. If you look at the slide here, anything in bold, font is considered a significant host of spotted lanternfly. Again, tree of heaven, which is itself an invasive species, is the primary host, but it does attack maple, walnut, sumac, roses, grapes, hops, uh, cucurbits, and other herbaceous plants. What kind of damage are we talking about when spotted lanternfly attacks? Well, again, this is a sap sucking or phloem feeding insect it is draining basically the, the, the life force out of the tree or other plant that it is feeding off of. And the way that it does this is not, it's not the same as, as you sucking liquid through a straw. It's using its mouth parts to pierce the plant's outer layer, either you know the bark or cuticle, whatever. And when it does this, the a pressure is released and the sap will start to flow into 
the mouth parts of the spotted lanternfly. And the reason why this is important is this is a tremendous amount of pressure and it's a lot of water and sugars and, and lipids and other things. And it's way more than, um, than one spotted lanternfly can handle. You could think of it like a, a balloon filling up and then eventually bursting. And so the way that spotted lanternfly deals with this is that at the same time as it is feeding, it is excreting a lot of this as waste material. Again, that waste material, which we call honeydew, is a lot of water and a lot of sugars, which makes it a really sticky, gross, sometimes gooey substance that's being excreted from the lanternflies while they feed. And I think I have a video that I'll show you in a few more slides. This honeydew is excreted all over the plants that they're feeding on and any plants that are around and all over the, the ground, the lawn, the forest floor, wherever they are. And they can create these sort of ecological dead zones where it's all honeydew and then a sooty mold fungus that grows on top of the honeydew and then sometimes additional white fuzzy fungus that will grow on top of that. Uh, there's very little wildlife activity in areas like that other than the lanternflies and some other opportunistic insects. Unfortunately, those opportunistic insects tend to be a lot of things we consider pests like wasps and hornets and ants that are feeding on the honeydew secretions and sometimes uh, at the wounds that lanternfly makes in the tree. Um, and also at the same time, anything that is getting covered with the honeydew and resulting sooty mold is going to have reduced photosynthesis because um, well, I'll show you a slide on that in a second. Reduced sugar production and just sometimes loss of cold hardiness and general loss of, of health of the plants that are getting attacked. This is a couple of close-ups of what the mouth parts look like on spotted lanternfly, just so that you can get an idea of what you're looking at. Um, on the adult lanternflies, the mouth parts are a lot longer and stronger and so they can easily feed right through the, the bark of a tree but the nymphs have smaller mouth parts and tend to rely more on greener um, and herbaceous plants. This is an example of sooty mold growing on a grape leaf and you can see again sooty mold is called that for a reason it, it looks like soot or ash it's black and the parts of the leaf that need to reach the sun in order to produce, um, in order to photosynthesize and produce food and energy for the plant are green, those chloroplasts in the leaves. If they're covered with black, they aren't getting through and they aren't able to do the work that the plant needs to survive. And here's a photo showing that is a, a European hornet, also an introduced species feeding on the sooty mold covered, honeydew covered trunk of the tree while the spotted lanternflies are congregating. That's a particular problem if say the lanternflies are swarming in a pick your own orchard and now you have all these stinging insects flying around as well. And here's a problem that you might not be thinking about if you're just thinking about agriculture. Uh, spotted lanternfly causes a lot of sort of cultural issues for folks that live in heavily infested areas. This is somebody's back porch. If you look at the bottom step, looks normal. Two steps above it, super shiny, sticky, and covered with black sooty mold. It smells really bad and it is very slippery. Also, if you are in an area where there are spotted lanternflies and there's a lot of them, they are going to do things like land on people and make them feel kind of uncomfortable about being inside. And it doesn't matter if you're out for a jog or out to give a speech to the entire country. If there are spotted lanternflies around, they will land on you and, and be annoying. And here's some pictures of when the spotted lanternflies actually congregate by the thousands they will gather on trees, they will feed, and then they'll typically move on in a few days. Nobody really understands exactly why this is happening, but certainly if this is happening in your backyard, you are probably not going to be out there at the same time. And I know there won't be sound for this video, but I still just wanna show you the video. It says screen sharing is now paused, so maybe you aren't seeing the video. Tony, can you let me know? It is working.
It is working, okay. I have no idea why it says screen clearing is now paused. That is uh, misleading. But anyway, um, hopefully everybody watching this went, oh my God, when they saw the guy wipe his hand down the trunk of the tree and there's gotta be like 10,000 lanternflies on this one tree. This is out in Pennsylvania, unfortunately at an airport, just to give you an idea of how challenging it could be to try to keep these pests from spreading. There we go. All right, so what kind of potential impacts are we talking about with a pest like spotted lanternfly? Uh, like I said before, the agricultural impacts, particularly feeding damage done on grapes, impacts vineyards and grape growers. It also feeds on and damages hops. We do have a small number of hops growers in the state. It impacts fruit growers when the pests swarm. Uh, it can impact certainly nurseries and garden centers that are growing plants outside. It is also a frust it can be a frustrating greenhouse pest as well when they get indoors. It could impact the hardwood and logging industries that depend on wood that are, come from trees that this pest is attacking. And also, of course, like I mentioned before, if they're going to be going into orchards, if they're pick your own, then this is going to impact agritourism, certainly. <clears throat> Excuse me. Certainly, as well. Uh, we are still learning about the ecological impacts of this pest. It's not thought to be going. It's thought that it's not going to be maybe a significant pest of forest. I think the impact is more going to be felt in urban areas where you have a lot of trees, like Tree of Heaven, in parklands. It's going to impact people's ability to kind of in, enjoy recreation. Um, grow things in their own gardens. I think farmers are going to see a lot of damage to, you know, some of the herbaceous crops they're going growing, things like um, cucumber, possibly tomato, basil, things like that. Um, although I will say, and I know that, you know, with something, a pest like winter moth, they, it's not like with spotted lanternfly that it's going to come in and kill a tree in a year or even several years. I think that what they found is that overall, you'll see minor health impacts that make it more challenging for a tree to grow and sometimes to compete with invasive species that might be growing in the same area, but have a, a competitive advantage. So to me, that's the major concern from an ecological standpoint. From a specific economic standpoint in Pennsylvania, it's been estimated that at least 2,800 jobs and $43 million of the economy of Pennsylvania are currently threatened by spotted lanternfly. Um, I actually saw a presentation yesterday that put the numbers much higher than that. So this number might be a bit old. I think this is another video. We'll see if, all right, this time go, go to webinar, didn't freak out. Okay, so take a look at the lanternflies on grapevines. They are not feeding on the grapes, they are feeding on the vine. And they can actually do noted damage to, um, I'm gonna pause it here for a second, to the vines and kill them over the course of just a few years. But the other thing I want you to pay attention to is it's not raining in this picture. This is video of, the lanternflies and they're excreting honeydew and it looks kind of like it's raining. In areas of Pennsylvania where they have lots of um, tree of heaven, I've seen videos that make it look like it's actually raining, but it's not, it's, it's gross sticky water that's full of sugar. Sorry, I think that's plenty for that slide. Oh, sorry. Uh, here, just some photos to show you the damage uh, and the way that they, descend on things like basil and blueberry, cucumber and horseradish, especially when they're in that younger or nymph stage. And something interesting that they've been learning about spotted lanternfly since it showed up in the United States, depending on the time of year and the life stage, they will prefer certain types of plants. So when the nymphs first hatch, they very often find them on roses, but in the summer and fall when they're bigger nymphs or in the adult stage, they don't usually find them on roses anymore. The same for perennials. So again, the May and June is when um, nurseries are going to want to be paying attention the most to this pest and looking for damage to their own plant. But when it comes to things like grapes and tree of heaven, spotted lanternfly is pretty much prefers those two types of plants any time of the year. 
in the later parts of the season, you will see them more on Willow and Sumac, and um, again, back on both Red and Silver Maple. They surmise that some of this has to do with the fact that uh, a lot of bigger trees, native trees, tend to um, have their sap out longer. Like Tree of Heaven sort of goes to sleep a bit earlier at the end of the season because it's uh, from a more tropical area and it's just evolved to do that. So they might find that they're not getting the food that they need from Tree of Heaven at the end of the season. They will try to get, get their nutrients however they can. And so they'll get it from Willow, from Sumac, and from Maple. All right, question number one. I'm gonna wait for, I believe that Jeffrey will step in and magically make the poll appear. Yes, he will, and I'm sorry, I forgot to acknowledge off. Jeffrey and Ellen helping us again today. So thank you, Jeffrey Jway, and we have Ellen Weeks here helping us today. And, and a friendly reminder to all, um, please make sure that you are filling out this poll question, particularly if you're looking for pesticide or association credits, but we invite everyone to fill this out now. Thanks again, Jeffrey. I forgot that as a presenter, I can't see the poll. Or I yeah, can't watch can. people filling it out. I missed that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll share the results. Yeah. Okay, the poll will close in 10 seconds. Poll is closed. So the results are 98% say Tree of Heaven, 1% Staghorn Hot Sumac, and 1% Black Walnut. Okay. Well, luckily, as Tani mentioned earlier, you don't have to answer correctly <laughs> to get credit <laughs> if you're looking for credit for your pesticide applicator's license. Uh, of course, Tree of Heaven is the right answer, and it's good to, to hear that most people got that. All right, I'm going to move on. All right, where does spotted lanternfly come from and where is this pest going? If you take a look at the map below bullet points, uh, you'll see that any place with the darker reddish color is the considered the native range of this pest. Any place where it's pink is where it has been introduced. So um, this lanternfly is originally from Asia, but specifically from China and Vietnam. It's considered invasive in Korea and other countries in Asia where it has shown up. It spreads primarily through the movement of egg masses. In Asia, in, in most cases, native predators and parasitoid wasps help keep it in check. Um, certainly, we have folks that are doing research into the possibility of introducing some of these as biological controls here in the United States, um, but it takes a long time to do that research properly to make sure that we're not introducing something that doesn't cause issues itself. Um, its history in the United States is that it was discovered back in 2014 in Pennsylvania. It possibly arrived there as early as 2012, and it was introduced through shipments of crushed stone from China. This is a map of Pennsylvania showing you all the survey efforts that they were attempting through from 2014 or so until 2018. And every single dot on this map is a place where they looked for spotted lanternfly. Anything red is where they actually found it. Anything green is where they looked and didn't find it. So you can see that through 2018 for a good you know, at least four or five years after this pest was introduced, it remained confined to the southeast part of the state. Um, this is a map accurate as of today in terms of what counties now have spotted lanternfly infestations in Pennsylvania. Um, the blue is what got added just over 2021. But you can see that the pest has been spreading outward from that initial cluster in the southeast. It's been spreading outward and also 
westward over time. Um, but when I look at this map, I think it wasn't for lack of trying, you know, that they they were trying really hard to keep this pest in check. And it just goes to show you how challenging it can be to prevent the spread of a pest with habits like this. This is the latest map showing every place where spotted lanternfly has been found in the United States. You'll notice, unfortunately, Massachusetts is included in this. I'm gonna go into detail about our state on the next slide. Any place, and the other unfortunate thing about this map is that it is getting so big that it is getting really hard for me to show you that counties in different states where they just found like an individual spotted lanternfly but they couldn't find an infestation are marked by little purple dots that are getting tinier and tinier every time I show this map because now we have to have you know North Carolina in there um, and Vermont and places like that but there's lots of little purple dots here but any place that has the blue county colored in means that there's an actual you know infested trees and, and egg masses were found in in um, out in the wild, so to speak. And here's the latest map from Massachusetts. Again, any place where you see a dot is just where we had an individual find, but we now do have two infested municipalities, both in Worcester County, uh, both Shrewsbury and Fitchburg. Astra is going to be talking a bit about that more in, I think, the next slide, but I just wanted to show you that as of right now, we've had documented finds in every single county except the Cape and Nantucket, none of, you know, the majority of these have not, have just been like hitchhikers. They haven't turned out to be actual infestations, but the pressure is there. And sometimes it can be pretty intense, especially during the growing season. Okay, poll question number two, and then we're gonna go to Astra. Where yeah, was spotted the poll... fly first found in the USA? Sorry, go ahead, Jeffrey. I was just saying the poll question is up. Okay, great. Just looking out my window, watching the trees whip back and forth. <laughs> so the poll will close in 10 seconds. Poll closed. The, res the results are 97% Pennsylvania, 2% New York, 1% Connecticut, and 1% Florida. Okay, uh, and just to note, it has not been found in Florida. It is in all of other states, but it was first found in Pennsylvania. Thank you. Okay, I am now going to turn things over to Astra Perkins. She is the team lead for our Spotted Lanternfly Survey team at the Mass Department of Ag Resources. So I think I need to stop sharing my screen. I can just send it to Astra okay. and I'm going to do that it. right now. Is it up there? Yes. Perfect. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm MDAR's SLF survey lead. Um, and I'm just going to do a little bit of an update about our last trapping season. Um, so it was actually our first year trapping SLF, and for a while, oops, what's going on here? So last year, I apologize, I'm having technical difficulties. Okay, so um, last season, MDAR initially set out 50 circle traps across the Commonwealth. Um, we tried to get a pretty good spread um, so that we could get different sites where traffic might be entering um, and exiting the state. And initially, um, we didn't find anything in our traps. Um, we get public reports through our website and they were mostly negative in, for introductions of single dead specimens, um, but we do do site visits 
at any verified reports. And a verified report is when someone sends in a picture of what they've found. Um, that's very important because we do get flooded with a lot of reports. Come on. And these are the circled traps um, that we use. They're just mesh screens that circle the tree and they have a lure attached at the top here. Um, it's just a pheromone lure and um, it just funnels the insects up into the plastic bag and that contains a pesticide strip so it kills whatever goes up in there. And here are a couple SLF caught in that bag. Um, so our site selection criteria um, are based on a few things. One is the presence of Alanthus altissima, um, Tree of Heaven, it's their preferred host. Also the presence of businesses receiving goods from infested areas. Um, so that includes Connecticut, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, um, basically all the way down the coast now. And then agricultural areas that are at greater risk, um, such as vineyards and orchards. And then our other areas of concern include transportation pathways. Um, and that's because SLF will lay egg masses on just about any surface. Um, trucking and train cars are considered to be one of the highest risk pathways. And there are many agricultural sites in the infested areas that are complying with treatment restrictions, but SLF is so prolific in the surrounding areas that getting everything around there is nearly impossible. Um, and often, Things will hitchhike just on a personal vehicle, on trucks, railways, et cetera. So those are becoming significant threats to our own environmental economy. Um, so in late July, we got a public report um, that came through our website. This is the actual picture that was sent in, and it's a fourth instar nymph. I explained that earlier, but it's instar right before it molts into an adult. And this generally is seen in mid um, summer. And so we went out to the site to investigate. Um, the people who had reported this had lost the nymph after they took the picture. Um, and we took a look around, set up circle traps nearby. There was a very close Alanthus to where that instar was sighted. Uh, we surveyed the trees, didn't see anything particularly suspicious. Um, but we set up those traps and continued to check them every couple of weeks um, for the next month or two. And about a month later, we found an adult uh, in the trap and several others were seen on the tree. And these are the actual trees. Um, you can kind of see the top of one of our bug barriers, which is another type of trap that we use. Um, that's just a, an inward facing sticky band that goes over um, foam wrapped around the tree and it again just funnels anything climbing up the tree into it and they'll get caught in there. Um, that find triggered a full quarter mile host limitation. Here's a map of some of our points. Um, and that is all host plants and as many flat surfaces as possible. Um, so basically each one of these points is a host and then we survey 30 feet around it. So essentially we are surveying every single thing um, within this quarter mile delimitation. Um, so during the summer, we did that. We weren't finding too much more. They seemed to like the trees that they were on. Um, and while we were doing that survey, MDAR part partnered with the Department of Conservation and Recreation, and we had these original trees treated with bifenthrin and dinotefuron. So, and a tephrin is, um, it can be an injectable or a bark spray. We injected the trees. Um, it was kind of late in the season, but it was warm enough that trees were going to suck it up and kill anything feeding on them. And then bifenthrin is the foliar spray. So this is someone from the DCR up there in a bucket um, spraying as much as she can and hoping to kill any adults that were on those trees. And while we were surveying the quarter mile boundary again in late fall, after the leaves had dropped, um, we found more infested trees. All of the trees were Alanthus altissima. Again, these are the actual trees that we found the egg masses on. Um, they had freshly laid egg masses. Um, it was found very late in the season. So most of the adults were either already dead or moribund, which is dying. Um, 
and we never saw any adults on these trees. We simply caught the egg masses. Um, and I think on those, there were about eight to 10 um, in that little section. And these Alanthus are a straight shot from the first Alanthus that we found. Um, it would have just taken a stiff, stiff wind and they would have blown right to their favorite tree because um, we had bothered them so much on the first tree. Um, so these are the SLF egg masses that we found in Fitchburg, uh, some of them, and they are really this hard to see. Um, they blend perfectly with the Alanthus bark. Um, you can tell that these things have evolved together. Um, you know, it can be almost impossible to see if you're standing at just the wrong angle. Um, so survey is a long and hard and focused process. Um, that was 2021, and then in late December, um, as surveys were wrapping up in Fitchburg, we got a report of a dead lanternfly in a driveway in Shrewsbury, and this is the actual picture that the reporter sent in. You can see they were very thorough, they gave us a nice focused picture, measured it, etc., and that's, we like to see that. Um, so as we were investigating that, and it was a very interesting case because person went dumpster diving on Christmas and then found this SLF in or nearby one of the things that she got out of the dumpster um, in her driveway a couple days later. So we went out to the site that she had dumpster dived uh, and we're investigating that when she reported seeing a second dead SLF a few meters away um, in her driveway again. So this was really suspicious to us and we didn't see anything at the original sites that we thought it may have originated from. So we went out to her property and saw that there were several Anthocyl Tessima in the direct vicinity, um, basically across the street from her, but we weren't seeing any signs of SLF there. Um, no egg masses, no adults um, on the ground, nothing of that sort, but we needed to do more investigation. So after we saw that original site, we checked the area and we noted that there was a high traffic industrial commercial area nearby. Um, and we found that while the original spot didn't seem to be suspect, it was near enough to that spot that we wanted to go and do a survey at what we suspected was going to be the most high risk um, area for introduction. So a few days later, I think it was like January 7th or so, we went out there to do a survey. Um, so my poll question uh, is right now. <laughs> Your poll question is up. Poll close. Poll question will close in ten seconds. Okay. Poll closed. This odds. 82% Worcester, 10% Franklin, 6% Essex, and 2% uh, Sussex. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I think some people need to do some geography, but um, it is in Worcester County, um, Fitchburg and Shrewsbury both. And so right now we're lucky it's just in the one county. Um, but anyway, as soon as we went out to Shrewsbury, um and started our survey at the location that we selected 
we found egg masses. And this time they were mostly on elms and birch. Um, and as you can see in this picture, a highly trafficked area, um, lots of trucking, and it illustrates perfectly one of the most common pathways that SLF has been known to spread. Um, so these are the Shrewsbury egg masses. Um, again, tough to see, birch and elm. Um, this is, I mean, elms are hard to see anything on, so they just look like fungus. You can see that around it, there is a bunch of lichen and fungus. Um, so that triggered another quarter mile delimitation um, in that area. And as of right now, we are actually finished with that quarter mile delimitation, um, and we didn't find any other signs of SLF. So hopefully this is just going to be another pretty targeted area um, where we can hopefully eradicate the situation before it gets worse. Um, but since our, our quarter mile delimitation is finished, we are now going to spread two kilometers in each direction of the egg mass find and do 20 point surveys, um, which just allows us to make sure that we don't have anything that kind of spreads sporadically or flu um, outside of that zone, et cetera, and that we do just have the small satellite population. Um, so as I said, transportation pathways seem to be the biggest threat in the fight against SLF. Um, in both the Fitchburg and Shrewsbury cases, introduction appears to be related from tra transportation from other states. We can't guarantee that, but they were both near um, areas that were that are highly trafficked, trucking. In Fitchburg, um, it's nearby to the railway, and um, overall, it's probably coming in um, from other states that way. So, what are we trying? What is MDAR trying to do about this? Um, so, we're going to do tree removals in Fitchburg and in Shrewsbury, um, and they're going to be removed before the growing season begins, before hatch in April. Um, we want these to be out of there. And the trees need to be chipped down to a one by one inch in 2D um, size. And so, and then the stumps will be removed and ground up. Um, and then the chips that we have are going to be transported to a local mass power plant, which will incinerate them. Um, we were just lucky enough that we have um, a power plant willing to do that. That's really nearby. Um, local chips won't be moving outside of the municipality and um, they are totally willing to take that material so we can be extra careful and really try to mitigate the threat of um, SLF spreading in Massachusetts, at least from these um, infestations. So any remaining material, um, if there's stumps that can't be ground for whatever reason, they'll be treated with herbicide so that they're not growing back and becoming um, juicy tender shoots for any nymphs that might've escaped the tree removal. And we're also going to continue our survey. So this May, we're putting up more traps than last year. We're going to put up 80 traps um, placed across the state. And the sites are based on their risk or if they were previously reported, um, dead fines, et cetera. And then our ground surveys are going to continue in the infested municipalities. Um, and areas with the removed trees will be regularly checked and treated. And then all verifiable public reports will be investigated and traps will be placed if warranted. So if you suspect that you've seen spotted lanternfly at any life stage, um, please report it to our website, https um, slash slash massnrc.org slash pests slash SLF report. Um, and with that, I think I will kick it over to Jen. Okay, great. And Jen, I'll pass the screen share to you. Okay, I'm going to try this again over to the PowerPoint. Is that working? Looks yeah. good. Okay, great. Um, Tony, if you're able to put the link to our website in the chat, I would appreciate it. I think I can only send to organizers and panelists, which is not going to be helpful. <laughs> It's already in there. I put the reporting website in Thank and you. your fact sheet area. All right, thanks. I can only see the um, 
the tree. Uh, yeah, I didn't scroll up. Thank you. All right. So we're going to try to go through some ID tips in the last part of the talk. You're, you've already been getting trained about how to find spotted lanternfly because every time you know, Astra shows you a picture of an egg mass, or I show you the, the pinned specimens, you're getting those search images in your brain so that you're going to be able to readily recognize this pest in all of its life stages. Um, and again, you were just kind of hearing a lot from Astra about ways that this pest spreads. Uh, it will lay its egg masses on, on any flat surface. That means it could be on a packing crate, a pallet, vehicle, a train, car, um, firewood and shipped and imported goods are a primary method uh, of this way of it moving around. And the adults don't fly great distances on their own, but they will, as Astra mentioned, catch a breeze and they can hitchhike. And the nymphs can't fly, but they will also, they are also effective hitchhikers. And unfortunately, Tree of Heaven, its primary host, can form pathways because it's a very common tree along railways and highways. Come on, clicker. There we go. All right. So what can you do about it? Let's first of all learn how to ID it. And I'm going to skip over this life cycle slide just for time. Just want to remind you right now we are here on this chart in February. So what are you going to be seeing? Either egg masses or dead adults, right? You might see adults that got brought in on goods or material shipped here from an infested state. So they're going to be dead the risk is pretty much zero but if you see something we want you to report it because it can be an, an effective way of discovering a potential pathway that could also be active during the the insects active period so we do want to hear about those dead finds <clears throat> in terms of identifying the adult spotted lanternfly is about an inch long and it has gray spotted fore wings with really vibrant red hind wings. These hind wings are not really visible when lanternfly is at rest. And sometimes you will see pictures of spotted lanternfly in outreach where the specimen has been spread. So you can see those really cool underwings, but take a look at the pictures on the right side of this slide so that you know what an actual live lanternfly looks like when it's sitting on a piece of wood. Um, spotted lanternfly also has a yellow and black abdomen. The abdomen swells up pretty big on the females when they're getting close to laying their eggs. Uh, and another thing to note is that spotted lanternfly, like a lot of um, true bugs in this, um, especially in the full gorge family, they have no prominent antenna. They don't have visible antenna They like, like a butterfly or moth does. This is just a couple slides to show you that even though spotted lanternfly seems to have very prominent ID characters, like the black spots and the red underwings, it somehow manages to morph into a pretty effective camouflage when it is on the trunk of a, an old tree that has all different kinds of shades of brown wood and, and lichen growth and things like that. So from far away, they can be pretty hard to detect when they're not moving around. And what I really want to talk to you today about the most is just the egg masses, because this is what, this is how the survey team found the Shrewsbury infestation. And like Astra said, it is really tricky to recognize these things in, until you've been trained. The egg masses are about an inch and a half long. They each contain maybe 30 to 50 eggs. And when the female lays them, she typically covers them with this grayish brown putty-like covering to protect them. But if you look at this suite of pictures going from left to right, you'll see that sometimes for whatever reason, the female doesn't cover them or she partially covers them and doesn't manage to finish the job. The other thing is that if you look at the third slide, that's like a, a, a sorry, the third photo, the covered egg mass when it's fresh and has the putty-like covering, it looks kind of smooth and brown. Uh, eventually the eggs are gonna hatch and the egg mass gets really weathered, but you can still recognize that putty coating, um, you know, even after the, the lanternflies have hatched and moved on. Here's some more shots of the egg masses so that you can see what they look like when there's a, a heavy infestation and there's a large numbers, large numbers of females laying these eggs, like in the slide, um, like in the photo on the left. 
the photo in the middle shows egg masses both covered and then on the top one you can see that she didn't quite finish the job there that female um, and then in the picture on the right i just want to show you what happens as the the egg mass ages and these little fissures and cracks form in the um in the putty like covering and just, here's more examples of every place where these females will lay their eggs when they are ready to lay them they're not necessarily going to be the best at finding you know a tree of heaven to do it if that's not where they are or there isn't one around they're just gonna hedge their bets and lay their eggs on a tire and the wheel wells of a truck <clears throat> on a, a chair as part that's part of your camping equipment on patio furniture anything like that you know what are the chances that if a nymph hatches out of here that it's going to find its food source in time maybe not that great but that's why insects have evolved this behavior to lay tons and tons of eggs and have tons of offspring because only a small number of them are may survive but it's still enough to keep the population going the most common look-alike around here in terms of the egg masses would be the Lymantria dispar egg masses or spongy moth egg masses. These are, they're usually larger. They are um, more of a rusty orange color. They're fuzzy. It doesn't look like putty. It's not smooth and shiny. It's fuzzy. And a lot of times you'll see these little black pinprick dots in Lymantria dispar egg masses, those are signs that this egg mass has been attacked by a, a parasitoid wasp. And of course, as Astra mentioned, you might also see fungal growth. Um, we got a lot of reports from folks in the Fitchburg area thinking they saw spotted landerfly egg masses at the end of the season, and it was just fungus because we had a very, very wet summer, end of summer and fall. So there's a lot of fungal growth, especially on older trees and damaged wood. Okay, so here's a shot of one of the elms from the Shrewsbury site. How many, this isn't an official poll question, but I just want you to start counting the number of egg masses you see and let's see how close you can get to what our surveyors found. I'm just gonna give you another like five seconds to kind of, I guess for folks who are doing this on their phone to kind of squint and look closer at their phone. This isn't supposed to be easy because it's in reality, it's not easy, right? There's trained surveyors out there that still have trouble finding 100% of all the egg masses. If it's a, you know, if the sun is coming in in the wrong direction, it can really make it hard to tell. All right. If you got one, then you're right. There's only one egg mass here, and that's where that are the red arrow is pointing. If you counted and ended up going onto your second hand so you could count on your fingers it's because you're seeing a whole bunch of fungal growth on this tree on all these different branches but really there's just that one egg mass in the middle and yeah this it really is this tricky which is why we show you all the pictures so you can get that search image in your brain okay um if your business is uh one that could be impacted by spotted lanternfly nursery industry, landscaping industry, any any industry really, there are several <clears throat> sort of steps that you can take to make sure that you're helping us keep this pest in check. Make sure that you train, that, that you get trained, you're getting trained now, but what about your staff, your coworkers, to both identify and report spotted lanternfly to us if you found it. Um, you know, how about putting up some educational materials in your office, not just so that your staff and coworkers can see it, but also so that the public sees it and the public knows that this is a pest that you are concerned about and, and prepared to deal with. You can order free outreach materials from that link. I will, you know, I will see if Tawny can get that link in there too. I didn't give it to you in advance though. If worst case, I can maybe have folks email it out or post it somewhere. Um, but here's another important thing. You need to determine whether your business is receiving materials from a state that has spotted lanternfly. And the other thing to think about is maybe you're getting nursery stock or any kinds of goods that you could, might be getting from out of state. Maybe it's not a state that has a known spotted lanternfly infestation, but they're importing stuff and then shipping it to you from an infested state. There's a lot of nurseries that 
get stock in and then ship it out to another buyer, right? And, and that happens with a lot of different goods and materials. We've seen it here happening in like the, I don't even know what to call the industry, but like folks that sell sheds and gazebos, a lot of that, you know, you might be buying it from a company in Massachusetts, but it's getting it's getting built using wood that came from Pennsylvania, which is an infested state. And often it's getting built by a crew that comes from Pennsylvania with the wood. You should be asking these businesses, you know, are you trained about a spotted lanternfly? If it's a business that's in a state that you know has spotted lanternfly, ask them, have, have you done compliance training? Do you have a certificate from the state? Ask them to show it to you, verify that they got the training that those states are offering. Also consider having a specific area where you keep shipments of stuff that you think might be coming in from a spotted lanternfly infested state, set up a time to inspect those things and, and set up times where you can check your property, especially if you have tree of heaven or grape for signs that spotted lanternfly might already be there. Uh, the one other thing I'll say about this is that, you know, if, if we do reach out to you because we've, we're trying to trace a, a possible shipment of something that might have had lanternfly on it we just ask that you kind of help inform us if we reach out our goal is to protect massachusetts agriculture by preventing the spread of this pest if your business becomes infested with spotted lanternfly it i mean that's something that could not only have ecological impacts but also economic impacts and it could severely restrict your ability to operate your business if you're trying to deal with swarms and swarms of lanternfly um, I just want to do a time check, Tawny. Is that possible? Yes, let's see. We're doing good. We want to leave some room for questions before we start our break at 10.15. So do you have maybe uh, five minutes left or less? Yeah, I am somehow ridiculously on time. Great. Okay. Awesome. Um, if you felt like I went over those best management practices too fast and or you would like a print version of this, which comes with a handy checklist of the most common things that could be harboring spotted lanternfly egg masses, um, including the nursery stock. We do have a best management practices document that we put together for the green industry that you can get off of our website, massnrc.org slash pests slash SLF. That's sort of a, a one-stop link that you can use to report SLF, download any of our checklists or, or print outreach material, see the latest list of towns where we found it, get a map, um, all kinds of stuff like that. So I do encourage you to check that out. Uh, we recently also put out best management practices for folks that are sort of in like the moving industry or if you're a resident in an infested town, then we have checklists of things that you should be looking at before you, um, Sorry, just grabbing some water. Um, before you move things from your property, things like wheelbarrows and, and trash cans or camping equipment, if you're about to go camping, you don't wanna bring lanternfly with you. Um, you also don't wanna receive any of these materials with lanternfly on them. Um, you know, are, if you have Tree of Heaven, are you parking vehicles under it? Is there a possibility that you could have lanternfly in the Tree of Heaven? You might want to reconsider where you're parking your cars and trucks, things like that. We also have a, a quick reference driver's checklist now, both in English and in Spanish, that you could download off of our website that was adapted from the USDA's Hungry Pests program that is just for vehicles saying, you know, check your door, check your grill, check your wheel wells, uh, stuff like that. In, in terms of reporting, and I want to get this right. I got to move the little um, panel, the GoToWebinar panel. All right. As of right now, we are still asking folks to report all fines. And this is where things get a little complicated because in states that have been dealing with lanternfly for several years and have many counties infested, like New Jersey and Pennsylvania, you know, there's there might be a point where you say, well, we know it's in your town. You don't need to keep reporting it to us because folks can get pretty overwhelmed and resources are tight and you don't want to be dealing with, you know, 10,000 reports from Shrewsbury. If you know, that, know it's in Shrewsbury, you want to be focusing on other parts of the state where you don't have an infestation. But like I said, right now, 
we are still asking folks to report all five, but we're asking you to kind of keep an eye out and keep in touch with us because as things change, we might switch our focus to taking reports from just from locations that don't have infestations. Uh, but for now, if you see an egg mass or an adult, even if it's a dead adult, please do go to our reporting website and, and let us know. I think there. Other things you could do is follow us on Twitter at Mass Pests. This is just a couple more links to show um, and some screenshots of our order materials request form and our reporting website just so that you can get familiar with what that looks like. We will take reports for any pest or pathogen that you think you see, although I will just quickly say, um, we know everybody's seeing jumping worms. Um, so you don't need to send that one in, but other than that, we're happy to answer questions. We would always prefer that you send us a report if you're not sure, rather than not saying anything. And that's my last slide. I just want to say, you know, thank you to everybody for for coming today to listen to us, and also thank you to everybody who sent in reports of lanternflies. These are actual reports from Massachusetts. The one on the left is from our most recent find in Great Barrington, not an infestation, just some dead adults. Uh, and again, the the person in Shrewsbury that we originally thought was just another hitchhiker, but then that, you know, if if she hadn't been persistent about letting the survey folks know about that second adult she found. I'm not sure they would have thought to go out to that area and find the infestation um, off, off in that industrial area that they did. So we really appreciate the reports that come in from folks and we hope that you've learned enough from us today that it will help you easily recognize this pest if you see it. Thank you. Well, awesome. Thank you, Jen and Astra, getting feedback in the uh, from the audience saying great presentation with lots of great information. I just want to clarify a reporting thing that folks have asked about a few times. Um, and also to urge everyone, I've been sending, I'm sorry, loads of links in the chat. So you should all be receiving tons of links, um, including those for reporting in Massachusetts. I've sent some folks have asked about reporting in Connecticut and New Hampshire. I've sent some separate links for that but um, Jen and Astra we know we have our reporting link that you've shown repeatedly here for Massachusetts but for folks in other states it can be kind of confusing maybe to find the um, authorities to which they should report so do you want to speak to that a little bit I, you know there's two things I want to say about that the first is that if you, if we get a report of lanternfly seen in another state, we 100% handle that. We send it to the right people in the right state. So if you're really frustrated, like sometimes people are, and you're in New Jersey and you send a report to our website because it came up first in Google, then you got, you got heard and noticed. I don't want folks to worry about that. And other states are doing the same for us. But in terms of trying to figure out where to report it in other states, I would say that um, you can report it to the USDA. Um, I'm gonna try to come up with a link, maybe when, if Astra ends up answering another question. I feel like um, if you do the right search, you could come up with like, I think Hungry Pests website will take SLF reports and funnel them to the right state that way. Uh, there's not necessarily a one-stop place where you can go and um, just click and it will report it and send it to the right spot. But I think Hungry Pest has a list of, you know, oh, are you asking it for Connecticut? This is where you go. So um, I want to quickly try searching for Hungry Pest and Spotted Lanternfly, and maybe I'll let you know in a, a couple of minutes if that worked. But um, if that, you know, if you're, you don't catch the link, if we put something in the chat, then if you Google the name of the state and spotted lanternfly and report, that should be enough to get you to the right spot. You know, you can also just look for like, if you search for your state and Department of Agriculture and spotted lanternfly, that should work too. 
Perfect, thank you. Yes, I was going to say departments of agriculture, uh, university extension in your state, um, and also, uh, as Jen mentioned, the, the USDA, you could look up your state plant health director and perhaps reach out to them. Um, but uh, thank you for that clarification. And yes, please put that in the chat if you have the chance. All right, let me hop back to tons of questions, more coming in. We're nearing our break. Um, Let's see, we've had a few questions, uh, Jen and Astra, about host plants and specifics, whether or not spotted lanternfly attacks Japanese maple, um, as well as other maples, and another question about blueberries. Any any known finds on high high bush or low bush blueberry? Um, no, they so, feed on blueberry. Yeah. Right, go ahead, Astra. No, I was going to say they do feed on blueberry. Um, they also, so far, I believe it's uh, red maple, sugar maple, um, silver maple that they've been shown to feed on. But if we see any type of maple, uh, we look at it. I've personally seen egg masses on Norway maples down in Connecticut. Um, so, like we said, they will lay their eggs on anything and just leave their nymphs to find the nearest food source. But, I mean, they do feed on just about anything that's going to have, um, it, it'll be the new growth, the succulent flesh, so that it's easier for the nymphs. But um, we search any any maple that we see, um, even though they've been reported on silver and red. Um, but again, there, the list is huge. Um, it's over a hundred species of, of plants at this point. So it's hard to find something that they won't at least like lay their eggs on. Thank I, you. I and I the did, one thing, oh, oh, go ahead, Tony. I was just gonna say, I shared a link earlier in the chat to a, a publication that talked about, um, you know, sort of a lit review of the different hosts where spotted lanternfly has been found, if that helps too. But uh, go ahead, Jen. Well, first of all, thank you for sharing that ridiculously voluminous link to the USDA's Hungry Pest website. Sorry that it's not shorter than that, uh, but that is in the chat now. I was just gonna say, like, it, I mean, I think it might just be physically difficult for it to lay egg masses on blueberry simply because there's just a not not flat enough surface but it's certainly going to feed on it um because of the size do you think or just yeah the just because there's not a, a wide enough area i mean they will lay on really narrow like virginia creeper i'm like you can find really small vines with with egg masses on them unfortunately okay. And that speaks to a bit, there There were a couple questions about, um, and I'm hopping around because I want to get to as many as I can, but there were questions about where does spotted lanternfly lay its egg masses in the environment or on the host? And can you both speak to sort of what percentage on the ground we might actually be seeing versus what's high up in the canopy? And if I can also roll in, someone asked about, you know, is it easier to see them? using binoculars or a, or a bucket truck? What are some sort of, where are the egg masses? How do we see them? <laughs> um, so I guess the science says that they're mostly in the top, like two thirds of the canopy, one third of the canopy. They're high up in the branches. Um, anecdotally, that's what I've seen, um, that they like to be higher up in the tree. Um, again, they're feeding on sort of the newer growth if they can, if they're not over infested on one tree or something like that. Um, and we use binoculars to survey. Um, so we're out there looking at, you know, every branch um, in the top canopy of the tree. Um, they're not easy to spot. Um, and it's pretty unlikely that you're going to see um, an adult at least on the ground unless it's very late in the season and it's dying. Um, the nymphs, however, they will feed on the ground vegetation. If there's poison ivy around the base of a tree, they like that. Um, again, any like herbaceous plant that's down on the ground, you, you can find nymphs on those. Um, but they are tiny. 
they're really hard to see um, when they're in their first and second instars. Um, but just paying attention, um, and if there were an infestation, you might be able to see some of the egg masses lower on the trunk, but it's not highly likely. Thank you. I want to roll in some uh, uh, multiple questions on Tree of Heaven here. So um, one person asked about, uh, you know, early on, it was thought that Tree of Heaven was required a required host for spotted lanternfly. Um, could you speak to what the current knowledge is for the insect tree relationship? But I also want to roll in, if I can, what are some of the easiest ways to recognize Tree of Heaven, particularly this time of year, folks are asking. And then also folks are asking about, because Tree of Heaven is an invasive plant, um, are there any proposed you know, removal or control programs for Tree of Heaven? Oh my God! Are you sure you don't want to ask any more questions? <laughs> Sorry, um, I can go back, but I'm just trying to put them all no, in if we can no, touch no. on them. You know what? I I'm gonna skip the ID question because I don't feel like we can effectively answer that without photos, and that's like a whole other presentation. Um, there are guides online if you look up Tree of Heaven ID. Um, that's just my opinion. Astro might disagree with me. I'm blanking on the other questions, right? Okay, yes, for my understanding is that they have found that it can survive if it lays its egg masses on, um, that it doesn't need Tree of Heaven to complete its life cycle, but it does best and has the highest survivorship to adulthood. If it does, I believe it has been documented to complete its life cycle on maple and I'm blanking on the other trees. I'm thinking maybe low survivorship on birch. Um, I think there might be low survivorship on walnut. Walnut too, yeah. Um, so yeah, they have shown that it can survive without Tree of Heaven. It just doesn't do as well. Um, we certainly have enough Tree of Heaven around in Massachusetts to kind of keep it bolstered um, and to keep it going. Like when you have incredible invasion pressure, you don't need a lot, you know, if there's a million lanternflies but, that are born, but only, a, you know, 10,000 make it, that's still enough to do some damage, right? Um, I don't, ask me another question. <laughs> ask us another question. I forget what you asked. I'm sorry, and I'm trying to field ones that are coming in right now. So, yes, basically just about, I know it's it's a whole additional uh, presentation about Tree of Heaven. Um, oh, I did you touch on, um, folks are asking about whether or not managing Tree of Heaven, it would be helpful or maybe oh, speak to the you. difficulty of that. I mean, as Astra mentioned, we are attempting, you know, in the, the jury's still out on that. We are attempting to do Tree of Heaven removals where we found these infestations because they are very, as far as we know right now, very small infestations. That is not going to work in an area that has a lot of tree of heaven, like if it, um, because it's incredibly challenging to get rid of, right? That it resprouts, it suckers, it grows really fast. Um, we don't have a lot of resources to be doing large scale removals the way that they were with, you know, with like Asian longhorn beetle. Um, just the amount of retreating that would need to be done. Yeah, I, I, I mean, this is just my opinion. I don't, I think it's gonna be a challenge to make that work except for very limited satellite populations. I mean, I will also say as an invasive plant ecologist, um, we've never eradicated an invasive that way. <laughs> so it's not, you know, when people are talking about, well, we're just gonna get rid of all the tree of heaven and then we won't get lanternfly. It's not, that's not gonna work. Um, some states have had luck working with tree of heaven trap trees where you try to remove most of the tree of heaven and then leave a few and then treat those trees with pesticides so that when the lanternflies come and feed, they die. That That is again, not gonna eradicate spotted lanternfly, but it's a way of kind of um, removing 
a significant amount of a heavy infestation from the environment. So it can be used for to slow the spread, but it, it's it's not going to be able to work for eradication. Oh, that sort of answers it. I don't know if you have anything to add, Astra. No, I mean, right now we're doing removals of the trees that actually have egg masses on them <clears throat> that we found. Um, in Fitchburg, we're going a little bit further than that and removing, um, there's a couple acres that have little groves of Alanthus um, in the vicinity and we're going as far as to remove that um, to try to kind of create a wall um, where they don't have much um, to go to if anything does survive. But I mean, in Shrewsbury, um, like we showed, it's they're on elms and birches, and there's actually not a, a lot of Alanthus in that area to begin with. Um, so we'll be removing the trees and the trees in the immediate, uh, immediate vicinity, but um, it would be a huge task to try to do full host removal um, of Alanthus, especially in urban areas um, where a lot of times it's the shade tree um, in, you know, the center of Worcester, for example, there's a lot of them that, um, you know, they're the only trees around. So that's just too big of a task for right now for our small department. A really, really good point too. We don't want to be removing an entire street tree canopy when we know that it, that hasn't worked in other states, that kind of management. Um, Tony, I put a link to Penn State University's Extensions Tree of Heaven ID info. I think that's a really good resource. We've been using that until we develop something for ourselves. So if you were able to share that with folks, that would be great. Thank you. I had shared it earlier, but I'll share it again. Oh, no, There's so many links in the chat now. Um, no, I thank you. Both. See like a little inch of, of it, so I can't tell all the good work we're doing in there. Sorry. No, no worries. No, thank you both. I I know we're into our break now, but I I can't help but ask. There've been questions about, um, and since you're MDAR, I want I want to ask. Uh, folks are asking, what does the term quarantine refer to? Um, and related to that, um, if say a commercial nursery or um, others that are selling plant material um, it you know what happens to them if they are sort of in that quarantine or can, can you speak to sort of the impacts on industry and what a what a quarantine is I mean we don't have a quarantine in Massachusetts for spotted lanternfly right now um, we're you know our I don't have a lot of details about that, but our intent right now is to work directly with property owners on the limited areas that we have with spotted lanternfly. Um, so there's not, the, yeah, there. That's all I can say for right now. Like we, there is no quarantine, not in our state. You know, other folks that have questions in other states would need to refer to their own government to get the details. I think that's certainly fine. Can you just maybe define what a quarantine is in general? I mean, for Asian longhorn beetle, there is a quarantine in place that, that has specifics with regards to what materials can and can't be removed from a particular area or move, moved from a particular area. And it often depends on the time of year. and um and whether and, and often folks are required to have training about what the quarantine means and sometimes the training is what's needed to allow them to move articles i yeah i <laughs> thank yeah. you no i know it's... i mean i just i want to make sure that people aren't confused that there is a quarantine in place for spotted lanternfly since that's what we're here to talk about today yeah, and even if there is um, a quarantine drops like in other states, materials can still be moved. It's more compliance agreements with businesses um, to make sure that they are checking um, for a spotted lanternfly and possibly treating, like spraying. Um, 
to kill um, anything that they have, um, but it's mostly education and um, inspections. Um, there's definitely still nursery material moving from infested areas um, through other states. That's that's a really good point. Thank you for making that. Um, and and again, this is very pest specific. You know, for spotted lanternfly, it is true that there is definitely movement of stock that could be host material for spotted lanternfly. It's just required that people have that training. And that's why I was saying that you should ask, you know, if you're working with a business in an area that you know has spotted lanternfly, you should be asking them, like, did you get compliance training? They should have a, a tag hanging in their truck if they have, that kind of thing. And that's specific to other states. Right now, that is specific to other states, yes. We are just at the, again, we have, I mean, hopefully people kind of get that we're just, as of right now, we just have two very small satellite populations of spotted lanternfly in Massachusetts. We're attempting to take those trees out. There's not, we're not anywhere near what Pennsylvania or New York or New Jersey is dealing with right now. I mean, we hope we won't get there, we don't know. Right, we're gonna try our best to to stop the spread of this pest, but um, maybe it just makes sense to kind of keep pay attention to you know any news that UMass Extension is putting out or that we're putting out on our own website so that you have the latest information about spotted lanternfly because things are changing. Excellent, thank you. I think that's a perfect place to end so that we can give, well, what is it, <laughs> six or so minutes for the, the break. I'm sorry, but we had a lot of great questions and uh, uh, great feedback from your presentation. So thank you, uh, Astra and Jen both for that overview about spotted lanternfly and we'll give everyone a few minutes and return right at 10.30 uh, from our uh, environmental biologist with the Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources. Uh, and she will be speaking to us about an invasive agricultural pest uh, updates for Massachusetts. So thank you so much and take it away. Hi everybody, welcome back. Um, okay. I was expecting you to have to do that whole thing again about the credits, but I guess this is a, a package session. So um, I am back to talk to you guys about three more invasive pest insects that we are currently dealing with in Massachusetts. Okay, oh right, I hit enter. Hopefully you heard the beginning of my talk. Um, I think I hit enter to advance the slide and it toggled the mute button. So let me oh, try that again. You're okay. good. We we heard okay. you. All right. Um, hold on. I need to uh, move the panel so I can see my slide. Oh, I collapse this thing. Give me one second here with some technical issues. Um, Go to webinar has this whole <sighs> panel. It's wow. It's not letting me move it. Hold on one second. Should be able to collapse it with that orange arrow if you want. Thank you. Yes, there we go. Okay, good. I was sorry. My entire screen was freezing when I was trying to drag it across the screen. Okay. Um, so as you probably figured out from our previous talk about spotted lanternfly, the Mass Department of Agricultural Resources works with various state and federal partners to, to survey for and educate the public about a lot of different insect pests not just spotted lanternfly. Uh, a lot of these pests are typically ones we consider of regulatory significance, which means we are actually actively trying to, to do something about them, or we would do something about them if they showed up. And, and it also just kind of includes a whole bunch of different new pests or outbreaks of existing pests. Um, you know, everything from um, Asian longhorn beetle to winter moth and, and everything like that. So today I'm going to cover three more examples of introduced insect pests, but they've all had very different responses at both the state and the federal level. And my slide is, there we go. Okay, so the first one we're going to talk about is brown marmorated stink bug. 
something that I would expect most of you, either you're familiar with it or you've seen it and you just won't realize it until after this talk. Uh, this is a, another true bug like spotted lanternfly. It was accidentally introduced here from Asia. The scientific name is um, Haliomorpha halis. It's a, a stink bug in the pentatomid family of stink bugs. We have a lot of different stink bug species here. Some are native, some aren't, some are considered pest insects and some aren't. The marmorated part of the name refers to the marble-like um, look to the body of the insect, like in that photo there. Brown, brown marmorated stink bug is not just a crop pest. And again, it's a true bug, so it feeds on plant sap but it's also what we call it, like a home invader. But I wanna to talk to you about the agricultural damage that this pest does first. These are some pictures showing you various crops, some of which you guys might grow in your own gardens and, and some of which are, you know, significant money makers for the, the folks that grow as a business in our state, agricultural commodities, things like tomatoes, corn, grapes, um, brown marmorated stink bug will basically jam its mouth parts into anything that is juicy and fleshy. So it's not able to pierce the bark of a tree, but it particularly likes fruit. So a little bit different than the MO of spotted lanternfly. It's actually gonna feed on the fruit of a grape. It's gonna feed on apple. It'll feed on individual corn kernels and an ear of corn, things like that. Uh, specifically does a type of damage called cat facing, particularly on apples and, and firmer fruits in the rosaceae, um, where basically when it puts its mouth part or stylets into the fruit, the it releases an enzyme that kind of starts to dissolve the, the cells inside the fruit and causes decay and rotting. And that then causes these sort of dimples in the fruit that are ugly brown areas if you cut the fruit open. They, they call this cat facing because I guess they think people say it looks like the puckered cheeks of a cat. I don't see it, but that's what they call it. Um, I forget if we have, right, we have this great, from UMass Extension. Thank you, UMass Extension, showing you that, you know, if this injury occurs early in the development of the fruit, then it could often just be like a very superficial in injury, sort of look like a, a, a pin prick. If it happens as the apple starts to develop later in the season, then you are going to start to see obvious damage to the point where you know the fruit is maybe not marketable like someone's not going to want to buy it because it's covered with these sort of hard brown corky cell areas that make it hard to eat hard to cook with things like that now but like i mentioned this is also a home invader what exactly does that mean for a pest it's one of those pests like uh asian lady beetle western conifer seed bug that migrates indoors to hibernate in the adult stage when it gets cold outside. Are they harmful to humans? No, I mean, they don't, they don't bite, they don't attack humans, but they definitely can be a nuisance. And if you look at the picture on the left, that is, you know, hundreds of stink bugs on the side of a house. If you look at the picture on the right, that is a woman literally sweeping up the hundreds and hundreds of stink bugs that are all over her house. Like to have enough of an insect that you can sweep them into a visible pile and still not be done. Like that, that's a significant issue for homeowners. Brown marmorated stink bug was first found in the late 1990s in the USA, uh, again in Pennsylvania, coincidentally, since we just talked about lanternfly. If you look at the color coding on the map in the slide, basically the darker the color, in this case blue, but just you know, going from dark to light, the darker the color, the earlier the infestation was found. So you can see that kind of ground zero for this was um, in the mid-Atlantic area 
it gradually spread out from there, both to the Northeast and New England and down to the South and to the West. It was also found in the early aughts in the Pacific Northwest and in California. They don't know whether that was an, you know, another infestation or linked to the first um, finds in the Mid-Atlantic. It can be really tough to know things like that. It was first found in Massachusetts in 2007 in West Bridgewater down in Plymouth County. Here's a map. I don't know. I don't think they make maps like this anymore for this pest. It just kind of goes to show you what happens when a pest is just kind of thought to be established somewhere. So unfortunately, this is just from 2015. But I like to show this because if you look at the previous map, you see like that hot area around the mid-Atlantic on the eastern part of the country. Uh, and that retain, you know, that remains in 2015, but you can see now there's significant agricultural problems being seen from this pest, not only in Oregon and Washington on the West Coast, but also Indiana, Kentucky, Tennessee, New York, Connecticut, and all of those mid-Atlantic states that are in red where they're having both serious nuisance problems, so those home invasions and building invasions, but also significant agricultural impacts to crops where this pest has become established. Here we are in 2000, oh, right, sorry, there's one more map from 2019. Um, basically, things are getting worse. That's what you can take away from this map. There are even more states that are noticing severe agricultural problems. Um, the one other thing I will mention is that, and I remember Pennsylvania reporting this to us when they were first dealing with brown marmorated stink bug. Um, at the beginning, you just see, get those nuisance calls from the public, no one's seeing it in their growing fields. But that's kind of the warning signs. And then after several years, you start to see it come in and start to cause agricultural damage. And that is similar to what we're seeing here in Massachusetts. This is a graph that I just want to show you. We are not seeing this levels of this pest here in Massachusetts. We thought we would be. We're not exactly sure if it's just slower to catch up or if it's there's something else that's preventing the stink bugs from getting to this level. This is a graph of the number of stink bugs captured in one house in Virginia over the course of several months in 2011. I just want to reiterate, this is one single house separated into floors, first floor, second floor attic. It, they captured over 20,000 stink bugs. So that's the level of infestation they are dealing with. When I get calls from the public, it's maybe you know, under 10 stink bugs. And I'm glad that it has stayed that way in Massachusetts um, because I can't even imagine what it would be like as a homeowner to have to deal with 20,000 of anything in my house. Here is a map, uh, uh, sorry, a graph of uh, brown marmorated stink bug reports just for Massachusetts. Um, we actually stopped soliciting these reports after 2019. We still get them occasionally, but but most people don't even bother reporting them because they're just pretty much ubiquitous throughout the state at this point. Um, so you can see that first find back in 2007, and then it was really quiet. And then around 2013 or so, things really started to ramp up. Um, we got the most reports through 2017, and then things kind of just got quiet again. We know they're out there you know, folks see them all the time. They're just not reporting them. Um, and even then, the majority of these were and still are reports from, you know, homeowners or people that saw them in a building. Um, the one thing I want to add, and I don't think I have a slide for this, is that UMass Extension has been doing a lot of work with growers, particularly uh, in orchard environments, trying to track the spread of this pest. And they have been seeing the numbers being found in orchards going up, but still nothing like what they're reporting in states that are um, south and west of us. And I hope it stays that way. Um, Tawny might have something to add maybe in the Q&A, but um, like we're, we're not seeing the bump that we thought we would see five years after 
the homeowner calls started the way that that Pennsylvania and, and Virginia and other states did. But we are seeing a small, like a low level increase in agricultural environments. Okay. So how can you identify brown murmuring stink bug? There are three main ID characters on the adult stage of this pest. First of all, the alternating light and dark bands on the bottom edge of the insect's abdomen shown by the number one arrow. Second, the antenna with light and dark bands along the antenna, not unique to this insect, but certainly something to look for. Although a lot of times when you find them in home environments and they're dead or dying, their antenna break off. So you can't always use this character. But if you look along the antenna, you see these distinct sort of pale whitish fades in off the, the black on the antenna. The third thing to look for is down at the bottom, this diamond where the wings are visible. So again, this is a, 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 a true bug or hemipteran. It's hemi wings is the way of describing that. Um, in, in a way of reminding you that the wings are not completely covered the way they are with like beetles or other insects that have uh, that also have wing covers. There's always this little gap here where the wings are exposed and don't have um, a light for over them. And on brown marine stink bug, these wings are black versus, or at least like a smoky dark gray versus a lot of other stink bugs and other hemipterans where they are translucent or have markings on them. But on brown marine stink bug, they're typically solid black. Like other true bugs, um, brown marmorated stink bug goes through what we call a, an incomplete metamorphosis. So once the eggs hatch, the young stages or nymphs that, again, they are flightless like spotted lanternfly, but they look fairly similar to the adults versus something that goes through complete metamorphosis like a butterfly or moth where the young or caterpillar stage looks completely different from the adult moth. And so when brown marmorated stink bugs hatch, they are just very tiny versions of their adult selves. They have fairly brilliant orange bodies with black markings on the earliest instar nymphs. And then they go through um, three other instars before they morph into their adult form. The females tend to be a bit larger than the males, although most folks aren't likely to see both at the same time. But if you're sort of wondering like, boy, the one I saw yesterday seems small. Why is this one so much bigger? They're not like growing bigger. They're just, they, the females just tend to be larger. Now, again, we have a lot of different insects in the pentatomid or stink bug family here in Massachusetts, including a lot of native species. And some of these are actually predator insects that are considered beneficial in garden and agricultural environments, particularly those in the genus um, Podicis or um, what is it, spiny, spiny stink bug. There's also um, Euchistus species uh, and other um, there's another family of stink, stink bug-like insects that are called shield bugs that look very similar but are actually a different family. Again, we have lots of different versions of these insects that are many different colors, shapes, and sizes. So I tell you this so that you don't think you should be killing every stink bug you see. Uh, the other thing that we often get called from the public about is the Western conifer seed bug. I, to me, this doesn't look anything like a brown marmorated stink bug, but there are a couple of similarities. It, again, it is a true bug, so it's in the same order. Uh, when it is startled or squashed, it will emit a foul smelling liquid similar to what most stink bugs do, which is why they call them stink bugs. And they're also home invaders. So at the end of the fall, they will also try to come into your house and they'll be on the sides of buildings and looking for egress into buildings so that they can hibernate for the winter. So we do get calls from homeowners concerned about um, brown marine stink bug. It actually turns out to be Western conifer seed bug. This is an insect that's native to 
the United States, but actually is from the West Coast. It's thought to have been brought to the East Coast in Massachusetts on imports of lumber from California and other nearby states. You can separate it fairly easily from brown marmorated stink bug by the more elongate shape to the body. And more easily for me is to look at the very back pair of legs. There is this little wing or flare on it that to me, I sort of think of it as wearing bell bottom jeans. Um, this is a unique character for the family that Western conifer seed bug is in, the leaf footed bug or Coryidae. Here's a close up. Uh, so you can compare brown marine stink bug to Western conifer seed bug. You might actually see them aggregating on the same uh, side of a house or building, especially if the, that side of the building is light colored and in the sun because they will use the warmth of the sun to kind of energize themselves and then they look for a way inside. Uh, but again, Western conifer seed bug has that flare on the back legs that brown marmorated stink bug does not. In terms of monitoring, there are traps with lures available that effectively attract brown mar marmorated stink bug. They crawl up the, the green wings of the trap, attracted to the lure, and then get stuck inside. Um, unfortunately, mass trapping has not been shown to be an effective method of control in agricultural environments, but it is a good monitoring or detection method that you can use if you're concerned about this pest. In terms of indoor control, we always tell folks, first thing is figure out how they are coming in. Seal up any gaps that you have around windows or doors, repair any holes in screens, use caulk, use mesh wherever you can. Um, don't leave window AC units in past their usefulness because they can get in through gaps in the, you know, where those are installed. If you're dealing with a small indoor infestation, the advice is to trap and remove. A lot of these traps, they look kind of hokey, but they really do work. I am unfortunately um, the owner of a modified soda bottle trap in my own house right now that um, actually the current weather is really good for um, causing stink bug activity indoors because it's so warm that they wake up and think it's time to get out there and do their thing. And then when it gets cold, you'll find them kind of limping around on the floor or they fly up through your, um, through your chimney and out your fireplace if you don't have a fireplace screen. Super frustrating. Um, but the modified soda bottle trap, it's kind of ridiculously simple. You just take a like a one liter soda bottle, you cut the top off, flip it upside down and stick it back in and tape it up. Then you fill that little reservoir at the base with soapy water and you use the edge of the sort of that cut edge at the top of the trap to just scoop them up. So if they're on the wall, you just slide that up under them. They get caught, they slip down, go through the, the drinking hole of the soda bottle and they fall into the soapy water. <coughs> the soap makes it so that they can't escape from the water and they drown. If you are having more significant stink bug activity and you know a, a single trap with you manning it and running around the house doesn't work for you, you can actually just set up a, a, what they call a roasting pan trap and there's a, a link there. Um, you can just look up, if you Google roasting pan trap brown marmorated stink bug, you'll get the videos. It's seriously just a, a aluminum roasting pan, again, filled with soapy water because you need to be able to cut that surface tension um, so they aren't gonna be floating on the top. And then you shine a small light directly on the roasting pan trap and you leave that in a dark room. And at night, they will be attracted to the light, fall into the soapy water and again, drown. You can also just use a simple canister vac to suck up these pests if you have large numbers of them. But just keep in mind that when they get stressed, they leak that nasty smelling liquid. So you might need to deal with that if you're filling your vacuum with them. Uh, for really large indoor infestations, perimeter sprays of pesticides can be effective. We, I don't, 
I have yet to encounter someone that's dealing with this level of infestation where I would recommend that in Massachusetts. Of course, it, it depends on your comfort level. Uh, and and you need to, it's a perimeter spray, so you're using something like bifenthrin or some other pyrethroid to create a, a barrier to keep them from getting in around the house. But we always recommend that you try everything above that bullet point before you actually would need to do any kind of a, a pesticide application for this particular pest. Um, the options, if you're dealing with brown marmorated stink bug from an agricultural situation, is well there i mean there's a lot of them you can do something like you can put netting over or, or bag your fruits and you as long as you do this and are 100 percent sure that there's nothing inside the bag that's going to attack your fruit then that can be an effective way of allowing the fruits to ripen and harvest them um and then um keep the stink bugs out. You can also, I, I know people think that I may get this up, but you could just beat plants with a stick. It will disturb any stink bugs in there, knock them off. And that can be, a, I mean, you're not gonna get, you're not gonna keep 100% of the damage from happening, but if you're able, if that's something you're able to do for like a very small growing area, then you could just keep repeatedly beating the plants with a stick um woody plants obviously so that you're not damaging the foliage just the the trunk and it will knock the insects off you can use treatments something a product like that contains acetamiprid or some other neonicotinoid obviously um there are a lot of folks that aren't comfortable with using neonix now and you should always follow the label and apply it at the right time of year so that you're not uh, so that you're minimizing the risk to pollinators but you know that that is an option for folks that need to be able to harvest their crops and not have them be damaged by this pest. Uh, you can also use treated netting as row covers. So rather than spraying um, directly on the plants, you treat the netting with a pesticide and then cover the plants. And then anything that lands on the netting is going to be damaged or killed by the pesticide you just need to make sure you use the right gauge of netting if you're using netting, if you use netting that's too big then the stink bugs can just get through um and also you need to keep the timing right you don't want to be doing you want to be doing this after fruit has already set not when pollinators are trying to access the plants and pollinate them uh, some folks have had success with just treating the edges of a crop and using that as a, basically as like a barrier so that the stink bugs can't get into the center. They, some folks also do what they call trap cropping, which is basically sacrificing a particular area, uh, letting the stink bugs come in and then spraying just that crop and, and just realizing, well, okay, this is something, this, this part we're not harvesting this year, the stink bugs get this. Um, there is also a, an insect called a samurai wasp pictured in this slide in the bottom right corner that is being actively researched as a possible biocontrol um, still in the research phase it's not something you can buy um, just just scientists are attempting to determine whether it's being um, effectively spread in um, by i think actually umass is doing some studies of this but i again i'll let tawny speak at the end about that um, I just know that it's under development and not officially out there yet. Um, this is another, it's really weird giving this talk for U UMass Extension when I keep saying UMass Extension is doing this, but I often give this talk for other audiences. So I apologize if I'm not representing your projects correctly, but I just thought this was really cool. Uh, it's a really neat way of dealing with moderate to severe infestations of this pest it, it's called a a ghost trap and i don't know if they're still using this or if they were just testing it for a short time but basically it's a you know it's a way of using an insecticide treatment without having it directly on your crops so you can relieve the pressure on your crops from brown marmorated stink bug and yet not expose the fruit to pesticide you basically use that same insecticide treated netting that i mentioned in the last slide but you kind of set it up in a, a tent formation 
baited with a pheromone that attracts the stink bugs to it. So I think that's really cool if you have the space to do something like that. Um, sort of getting the best of both worlds. But the reality is, is that this is a pest that's here to stay. It's not like Asian longhorn beetle where the federal government came in and set up an eradication program, right? The, the feds are putting the majority of their money into studying biocontrols and other ways of managing this pest, but they pretty quickly realized that we weren't gonna be able to eradicate it. And that's kind of where we are in Massachusetts as well. All right, now we have a poll question. So the poll question is up. Thank you, Jeffrey and Jen. And just another reminder to all to please answer the poll question, especially if you're looking for pesticide or association credits. Full question close in 10 seconds. Then closed, full closed. The results are 10% scat facing, 83% cat facing, 1% dog facing, and 6% cat scarring. Jen? I, in, I don't even have the text of that question, so I think it was just asking what the name of it was. That, so cat oh. facing is the correct answer. All yes. right. <laughs> Sounds like the majority of people got it, which is typical. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next pest. Um, and also, I can see I already spent way too much time on the first pest, so I'm going to have to kind of pick things up a little bit. This is actually a picture of Asian longhorn beetle because I always feel like when I talk about rough-shouldered longhorn beetle that people think I'm actually just talking about ALB because we spent so much time dealing with Asian longhorn beetle in the greater Worcester area. Um, but this is actually the pet you're going to be talking about. And I think if you take anything away from my discussion of rough-shouldered longhorn beetle, it's that it looks almost identical to a pest that we're currently dealing with, Asian longhorn beetle. But rough-shouldered longhorn beetle, or Anaplophora tenensis, is not actually established in Massachusetts or any place else in the U.S. This is a very high-priority pest for both the state and the federal government. And so I'm going to teach you about it and how to identify it. Um, they sometimes also call it citrus longhorn beetle. I've switched over to calling it rough-shouldered because I think when you hear citrus, you think, oh, it's a citrus pest, and I am in New England, so why do I need to worry about that? But um, you're going to learn why in another few slides. The main vector of introduction of this pest to various parts of the country is, unfortunately, the nursery industry, particularly bonsai shipments, maple bonsai shipments. Um, the first introduction documented on the continent was back in 1999 in Georgia in the shipment of bonsai. Um, but in 2001, there was also an infestation found in imported maple trees in Washington state. Both of those were eradicated. Interceptions are uncommon, but they continue to occur both in Canada and in the US. Now let's talk about the ID of this pest. Again, looks a lot like Asian longhorn beetle. I don't know if you, you guys had Maybe Tani, you could just tell me now, did they have a talk about Asian longhorn beetle? Mentioned briefly, I believe, in Nicole Kelleher's presentation. Okay. Oh, is that where we are now with this pest? Oh, how the mighty Asian longhorn beetle has fallen. <laughs> we used to do whole <laughs> days on this thing when it first showed up. Anyway, um, so 
So you heard about Asian longhorn beetle to at least some degree. Um, Rough-shouldered longhorn beetle is a large longhorn beetle in that same Cerambicidae family called longhorn because the antenna are really, you know, is longer, longer than the body. It's a black insect with white markings and sort of black feet with a sort of bluish tinge to them. But rough-shouldered longhorn beetle is called rough-shouldered because at the top of the wing covers or elytra, like right behind the, the neck of the insect, so to speak, are these markings or pits. Whereas on Asian longhorn beetle, those markings are completely missing. And I'm just gonna kind of go back to the ALB picture so that you can see um, it's very smooth and shiny up here. The other identifying character that you'll notice in all of these pictures of rough-shouldered longhorn beetle is this white marking that's the called the scutellum at the top center of the wing covers. It's white on rough-shouldered longhorn beetle and black on Asian longhorn beetle. So there's a picture of it again in the hand. You can kind of make out the rough markings, those pits at the, the shoulders, but it can be really hard to tell unless you have a good camera or hand lens to zoom in there. Here are Asian longhorn beetle and rough-shouldered longhorn beetle, and then along with it, their biggest native look-alike, the white-spotted pine sawyer. Um, again, on the, on the introduced insects, shiny black body with distinct white spots and black and white banded antenna. On the left, the rough-shouldered labeled here as, as citrus longhorn beetle. It's just, sorry, it's already on the slide. I, it's not my edit. Um, you can see all the rough markings up here, whereas it's smooth here on Asian longhorn beetle in the middle. And then on the left, again, the white scutellum at the top of the center of the wing covers on rough-shouldered longhorn beetle, and then it's black on Asian longhorn beetle. Now compare this to the insect on the right, the native white spotted pine sawyer has a not a shiny solid black body, but more of a bronzish black body, very indistinct white spots if it has them at all. The banding on the antenna is much fainter. It does have that white marking at the scutellum, but other than that, these are fairly different looking insects when you see them all side by side. Also, the white spotted sawyer, again, it's native. You don't need to report it if you think you see it. Although if you're not sure, please do report it. Uh, in terms of ID, the rough-shouldered longhorn beetle is going to be doing damage to typically the base of trees versus Asian longhorn beetle where you see the holes in the upper canopy, sort of like spotted lanternfly. This is a, a sort of a, a, the MO is to attack the trunk of the tree. These are egg pits that the insect has chewed into the trunk of a tree. I think it's a maple, I'm not sure. <clears throat> These are the X holes, again, coming out of roots at the very base of a maple tree. They are perfectly round, smooth on the edges, kind of looks like someone drilled the hole, very similar, again, to Asian longhorn beetle, but typically found at the bottom of the tree, not in the upper canopy. This is the current distribution of rough-shouldered longhorn beetle. You'll see, see the purple? This is actually a pretty significant pest in a lot of parts of Europe. As a matter of fact, here is a close-up of the distribution showing it in France, Italy, Germany, and, and across in the UK as well, and also over in Turkey. One of the reasons why we're really concerned about this pest, uh, and it makes it a bit different from, again, Asian longhorn beetle, which you might have heard attacks particularly maple trees. Rough-shouldered longhorn beetle is much more polyphagous or has a, a, a taste for many different types of species. It can attack more than 40 different types of plants, uh, genera of plants, over 100 different species. Its main hosts are citrus, apple, um, you know, around here, it's gonna also attack things like poplar and willow, important components of our hardwood forest, but it will also attack maple, rose, beech, hibiscus, sumac, even oak, again, which Asian longhorn beetle doesn't. What are we doing about rough-shouldered longhorn beetle? Well, again, we don't have it in North America and we're, we're trying to keep it that way. So host material from countries that have 
known infestations that aren't being managed, it, it's not allowed to be brought in unless it's bonsai. But the bonsai can only be brought in under quarantine to ensure that they are rough-shouldered, longhorn beetle free. That typically involves keeping them for a significant period of time in a sort of a, a, a caged or um, isolated environment so that if something does emerge from them, that it can't get out into the natural environment. Uh, any host material that's brought in from countries in the EU that we know have infestations has to be accompanied by a phytosanitary certificate, which is basically, you know, that's something that, that we do in Massachusetts for exports from our own state. It's verification that an inspector checked it and certified that it's free of pests. We're also doing surveying and monitoring of nursery stock throughout the state every year through our, our CAPS program. And of course, doing outreach and education like I'm doing today. That is time for another poll question about rough-shouldered longhorn beetle that I seriously got to look up what I said I was going to ask. Um, all right, Jeffrey has opened the poll and I was saying rough-shouldered longhorn beetle differs from Asian longhorn beetle how? And you're picking the best answer there. Jen, while folks are answering the poll question, there have been some questions about, um, and I'm sorry, I've been answering questions in the chat. Are your slides maybe being cut off at the bottom? Oh, um, no. Uh, I'm not sure to what extent here, but um, oh, one person is saying their screen is zoomed in. So perhaps it is an individual user thing, but I've, I've had a couple comments on that. Um, so we'll see, I'll look for it and maybe we can stop sharing the screen, and push it back to you just to see if we can fix it. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking, I don't, I, I was maybe a little liberal with the bottom margin, but I don't see anything that they're missing that would have um, impacted their ability to understand what I was talking about. But let's, you know, for box cream off, let's, yeah, let's check on that. Cause those are new slides. Oh. Okay, I I'll cut off a lot of photo credits. <laughs> I'll close the poll now. Okay. So the poll, the the, the results of the poll question: five percent say the rafshunda is only attacks citrus trees. Seventy-eight percent said. It has many more hosts than Asian longhorn beetle. Nine percent said it is um, smoother and shinier than Asian longhorn beetle, and eight percent think it's a trick question. Both are names of anoplophlar chinensis. Okay, so the right answer was that rough-shouldered longhorn beetle has many more host trees than Asian longhorn beetle. Uh, hopefully, you get by the common name of this test that it is not smoother and shinier than Asian longhorn beetle, uh, and they are separate species. Okay, thank you. Let us move on to the next part of the talk. I want to talk to you. So we, we covered a pest that isn't really being regulated. We covered a pest that is under significant levels of regulation to the point where you can't even import some material that might have it from other countries. And now we're going to talk about a pest that isn't here yet but we're currently dealing with some regulatory incidents um the box tree moth or Jen, Jen, I'm, I'm not seeing way, i'm not seeing you right now, but... <laughs> really let me yeah. let me take it back and i'll push it back over to you you're just missing Sorry, the folks. i don't think i did anything but let's see um all right oh, yeah, here it, here it comes I swear I didn't click on anything different. 
Okay. Can you confirm that you see just the box no. stream off slide? Yes. Yep. Okay. Uh, can you reduce the zoom on your screen? The bottom is cut off from you. Uh, one thing I will say is that when you guys are sending me messages in the chat, I couldn't see it because I minimized, I collapsed the, the chat window so that I could read off my slides. So I apologize for not seeing that. I don't have any zoom. Maybe you're, yeah, I, there's no zoom. Is when there a we, zoom option when, and, and go to webinar? <laughs> when you, when you took over the screen, did you select just your uh, PowerPoint window or did yes. you select just like show my desktop? No, I always just do the PowerPoint because I don't want to show my desktop in case I'm, I accidentally show you my email screen or something. I'm wondering though if maybe that's part of it. I, would you feel comfortable trying that, or should we just press on because we're short on time? Yeah, I'm gonna wait until we get to a slide that you can't see properly. Okay. Okay. We'll, we'll go from there. It, okay? All right. Go ahead. Sorry, Jen. I mean, no. It's it's. So I'm. You know, we test this multiple times and yet somehow still have technical difficulties. Right. Um, I just want to clarify, like you you can see all the text yeah i don't know how you know if you're seeing all the text but it doesn't appear to be cut, cut off, off here. on this slide right yeah it, it looks okay. good on this slide okay so let's just try to go through this okay what about so at the let me just check here at the very bottom of this slide it says not thought to be established can you see we, that we see that it's just very tight it's very um, tight. Okay. It's like right up against it, but we can see that. So perhaps okay. it's not being totally cut off. That's the bottom of this slide. I will use that as a, a marker and I will deal with it um, if I can. Um, okay, go I ahead, continue. The information. Okay, so box tree moth is a moth in the, the Cramidae family. Uh, it is native, again, another pest that's native to Asia. To, China, Japan, India, Korea, and Eastern Russia. Its primary host plant, it's, it's very specifically attracted to boxwoods. And of course, boxwoods are a major moneymaker in the nursery industry. The main vector of introduction of this pest is the nursery industry. It was first found in North America very recently in 2018 in Ontario, Canada. And it was first reported in the USA just this past year when it was shipped from a grower in Ontario to nurseries and distribution centers in the following states, in Connecticut, Massachusetts, Michigan, New York, Ohio, South Carolina, and Tennessee. The states that are bold are the ones where when inspectors followed up, they actually found infested boxwoods in the nurseries that these products were shipped to. Um, and of course, we're concerned because we're in Massachusetts. If you're in Connecticut, you should also be concerned. Um, all of New England is kind of on high alert for this pest. As of right now, box tree moth is not thought to be established in the United States. Okay, I think the bottom of the map is gonna get cut off here, but it does not matter for this slide. Just wanna show you again, the distribution of this pest kind of reminds me of the rough shouldered longhorn beetle distribution where you have the native range in Asia, but then the all of these countries in Europe that um, have been infested by this pest. And again, I know that caterpillar is getting cut off, but I thought this was a rather cheeky slide that I borrowed from Oregon State University uh, because it just has this silly map pack that just all of Canada is somehow gone and just a map tap, tack representing Toronto. But this is just to give you a sense of perspective. Infested boxwoods were detected at nurseries in the three states marked on the map, Connecticut, uh, Michigan, and South Carolina. So again, the host range for box tree moth is typically just boxwoods or boxes species, European boxwood, little leaf boxwood, Korean boxwood, any of those boxwoods that you typically see in the industry. Um, usually for us, that's the, the bigger boxwoods, Sempervirens, and the little leafs, um, Buxus microphylla. But there are other species around, and it will feed off of any of them. Box tree moth has also been reported on species of Euonymus, um, some species of holly, and species of 
um, a, a, like a, a mock orange or um, orange jasmine, which is Morea paniculata. Any of these species are available for sale in the nursery industry. There's also been some evidence that it could feed on other possible host plants, including, unfortunately, uh, blackberries, pachysandra, and smilax. Um, at least the blackberry and smilax part of things are of particular concern, just more because we don't want there to be a, a place where these pests can kind of have refuge if we are just focusing on treating boxwoods. Okay, so I know that this is going to be cut off. Um, I'm just going to work through it. I just want to show you this very simplified box tree moth life cycle. Um, again, it's a moth, so we have these four distinct life stages. We have the egg stage, the caterpillar stage, the pupil stage, where it morphs into the adult, and then the adult stage. Um, depending on where box tree moth is living it could go through anywhere from one to up to five generations per year obviously where it's warmer it's going to get through more generations they're predicting that in a state like massachusetts it's probably going to be more like two generations per year that's what they're seeing in ontario once the 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 entire life cycle if it's not interrupted by winter would be about a month from egg to adult the adults maybe live two weeks. The females live longer than the males. Um, if the, and species overwinters in the caterpillar stage and these neat little devices called hibernariums. That's basically some webbing where they sandwich together two boxwood leaves to protect themselves. And they're in the middle of the sandwich. It's called the hibernarium and they can survive winter temperatures that way they sort of wake up based on the temperature in the spring and start feeding again and then complete their life cycle. Okay, so in terms of ID, box tree moth typically looks like the insect on the left. This is called the light form. This is typical. Pay attention to the irregular brownish black border around the entire length of the forewing and hindwing. The white sort of pearlescent um, wing color in the center of this, and then these white comma-shaped markings on the forewings, right there and right there, marked by the blue arrows. Like a lot of moths in the Cramidae family, they have sometimes this, this rarer dark or melanic form where the white is filled in, but you can still see these white comma-shaped markings, and that's important. Once the moths lay eggs. The eggs can be found under on the underside of boxwood leaves, but they are incredibly tiny. I'm, you know, this is just estimation. I think an egg cluster is maybe a third of an inch. Okay. I am not sure what happened, but my PowerPoint just vaporized. So I just don't, I didn't touch anything. And I'm suddenly seeing my my PowerPoint and not my slides, but the PowerPoint app. So can you just you're, confirm? You're back to the box tree moth ID with the eggs. Okay, I, don't know. I didn't touch anything. Okay, the eggs are pale yellow and are laid in overlapping clusters of like five to 20 eggs that, that are overlapping like shingles. They can mature in as few as three days uh, or more, more up to six days. They start out pale yellow and then they gradually get browner. And then right before they're about to hatch, you can see the dark brownish black heads of the caterpillars right before they pop out of the eggs. I think it's kind of cute. <laughs> I know it's a pest. Uh, these are, this is a more typical caterpillar mid to late instar. They're about an inch and a half long. They have distinctive black heads. They're a yellowish green color and they have stripes of a pale creamy yellow and brownish black longitudinally, longitudinally or vertically down the backs of the caterpillars and then these black spots with white circles with the hairs or um, with the hair sticking out of them. This is a more realistic view of the caterpillars that you're likely to see in an infested boxwood. The younger or earlier instar, smaller caterpillars do what a lot of 
larvae do when they're very small. They start out by eating just the a layer of the leaves rather than devouring the entire leaf. So what you see here is that the the caterpillars kind of created this like pocket on the picture on the left where it's eating it's sort of inserted itself in the sheath under in between the layers of the leaves and is feeding. Uh, you can see some of the webbing here that's the whitish area and then all of these little white granular things are the the fecal material or frass created by the caterpillar. As the caterpillar gets bigger, again, you can see the webbing it creates within the boxwood plants that it uses to kind of shield itself from predators. So it will, the webbing sticks to the leaves and kind of pulls them in so that you can't see. It can just kind of go on feeding undisturbed. Uh, and, and this is just a close up of that picture so that you can see again some more early instar feeding where the caterpillar is using the the silk it's generating to pull the leaves together as a way of um, hiding from predators and then um, you know as it eats it's generating all of this granular frass things that you can recognize for id um, as they get bigger and head on to their full size you will start to see that they're eating the full leaves and if they run out of leaves they will start to eat the bark of the boxwood tree and you start to see the leaves that have been fed on significantly dry up turn brown and die here's some more images of that this is a heavily damaged boxwood and the inset on the um on the right is just to kind of zoom in there and show you first of all there's three caterpillars here and there's just so much frass at this point everywhere in this picture like this whole area is just basically dead and dying shredded leaves and caterpillar poop um this is just another close-up of the feeding damage you can see the the leaves have been shredded down to just little strings other leaves are dying and turning brown Here's even more progression of damage. And then eventually you could end up with a mature boxwood being almost completely decimated by this pest. Once the caterpillar has eaten enough, it goes into its pupil stage where it is going to transform into an, an adult. This is a really nice slide showing the progression from the caterpillar pre-pupil pre on the left to the greenish yellow pupil case that gradually turns dark brown as it matures. The pupil case is can be found inside the shrub. So I know a lot of insects, when you hear about them, they go into that pupil case and then the pupil case will like drop into the soil or be maturing in the leaf litter or something like that. These will be hanging from boxwood leaves or be just kind of enmeshed in the denser part of the shrub down near the base. In terms of lookalikes, the box tree moth doesn't have a lot of them in Massachusetts. The melon worm is its closest lookalike. It's in the same family, the Cranbidae, but it doesn't have that white comma-shaped marking on the wings that the box tree moth does. It's also about half the size. Um, and it's a fairly rare, well, let's, I don't wanna say rare, it's an uncommon species in Massachusetts, but it does occur here. We also have other moths in the Cramidae, like the pickle worm moth that sort of has the same brown border, but it doesn't have the white center or the, the pearlescent white center on the wings. And then we also have the common spring moth, which is actually in, in the inchworm family or geometridae that also has the, the dark border with the white center, but it doesn't have, again, those white comma shaped markings are pretty distinctive for this pest. So what's being done for box tree moth? I have four minutes. All right. Um, they used to keep box tree moth out of the United States by just saying that nobody except Canada could import the host plants. But in May, the USDA issued a federal order halting import even from Canada of Boxus euonymus uh, ilex and maria species. They're also working with states that could have been impacted by the import of these boxwoods by tracing forward the shipments, as I showed you in the map earlier, locating and destroying any plants that could have been infested, um, setting up these bucket traps with lures 
at various states, and a lot of states are running these surveys as well. Um, for 2022, the USDA is actually going to be deploying traps both in Connecticut and Massachusetts. In Massachusetts, they'll be setting 45 uh, traps at 45 sites that are either nurseries or very high risk sites with boxwood plantings. Um, other than that, we're just doing our best to put out press and, and run social media posts about this pest so that people are looking for it. Again, it's pretty distinctive in its adult stage. In its caterpillar stage, what makes it distinctive is it pretty much is only gonna be found feeding on boxwood. So if you find something that's doing damage, like an insect that is doing foliar damage to a boxwood, we would like you to report that to us, look for that webbing, look for the green and black caterpillars, look for the, the adults flying around and, and do report it to us. All right, last poll question. Um, did the poll question get deployed? I did. I don't know. I lost. I've lost my. Uh, I don't know what's going on. Let me see, Jeffrey, if I can send it out. Um. Hold on. All right. I think I've launched it. Yep. Yeah. I ju just got it back. Cause I don't know. It disappeared on me. I don't know why. Sorry, I'm glad I'm not the only one having issues <laughs> with this thing today. We're almost to the end. Thanks, folks, for bearing with us through all these yeah. technical difficulties. So, yes, the poll is launched, and I see folks are voting. So I'll yeah. take over Jeffrey, and I can... Uh, I have it. I have it. Oh, you can see it, too. All right, go yeah. ahead, then. <laughs> We've got about 60% of folks voting, so please, again... And respond to this poll question if you're looking for pesticide or association credits, and we encourage everyone to respond. Yes, and the poll question is, the best place to search for box tree moth caterpillars is, and you are supposed to pick the best one, so. You have 10 more seconds to answer the poll. Okay, the poll is now closed and the results are 2% um, said in the first two inches of soil in the container, 59% says said in webbing on the tips of boxwood branches. 10% in leaf litter around boxwood shrubs that have lost leaves and 28% in webbing in the center of the shrub. Okay, the last answer was actually the correct one. Um, again, these caterpillars are using webbing to secure their spot in the shrub so that they can feed on the leaves. They're also using it to obscure their hiding spot from predators that includes from us so you're going to want to look for them you know not at the on the edges of the shrub but but in the center in that webbing okay um this is just some basic advice about looking for pests and reporting them and stuff like that that i'm just going to skip over in in the interest of finishing up <laughs> thank you jen uh oh, perfect yes we can uh jump into some questions here very quickly, maybe about nine or so minutes for that, and then I'll have to uh, provide folks with the instructions for pesticide and association credits. So please, those of you looking for those, uh, do not log off until we have the chance to go over the final instructions. Um, okay, so first question here, um, Jen, this is from Sean, he's wondering if, there are any volunteer opportunities for folks that are interested in helping MDAR or any agencies across Massachusetts to assist with uh, in, invasive insect or pest um, surveys or management or, or do you know of any volunteer opportunities? We don't currently have any 
oh, hold on. I, what I want to do is stop sharing my screen for this because um, I want to look up a link. We don't have any formal volunteer programs right now. Um, you know, COVID kind of put the kibosh on a lot of that stuff. And so we haven't done it for a while. What we do have is, I cannot stop my phone from ringing. Um, what we do have is a project on iNaturalist for tracking Atlantis that's specifically related to the Spotted Lanternfly project. And I'm looking that up and gonna put a link in the chat for you to share, Tawny. Um, the reason we have that particular project is you know, in, in herb, we know where Atlantis is most commonly found. It's going to be highways, railways, and in urban areas. But we also know there's pockets of it out in suburban areas that we might not know about. And so we're asking folks to report that. So I would put, if you don't mind, I'll put that in the chat. We don't, other than that, we just, you know, it's not formal, but we would like folks to be checking their boxwoods if they have them for signs of boxwood, box tree moth. But there's that link for you to share. Thank you. Okay, I'll share that the next chance I get. And let's see our next question here. Um, oh, question from Brian for about brown marmorated stink bug and um, if perimeter pesticide sprays can be used preventively. And I will just add a comment from Gary about this, uh, saying perimeter sprays must be done on the exterior of the building, not inside. Some pyrethroids have restrictions on use over impervious surfaces. Um, so I guess, do you want to speak to any of that? Yeah, I apologize for not making that clear. When I said perimeter spray, I did mean the exterior of buildings, not inside. Um, and I should have made that clearer. I guess I figure with this audience, folks know that. Plus the label is gonna say that anyway. Um, you know, anything like that is going to be preventative, but I wouldn't advise it unless you've had repeated documentation of, the, of these insects showing up like by the hundreds. And we haven't really been seeing that, at least in Massachusetts. Thank you. Um, very helpful. Oh, and I wanted to comment. You mentioned about UMass Extension's work on the samurai wasp for brown marmorated stink bug. Um, yes. I just wanted to, to point out that the fruit program and uh, Dr. Jaime Pinheiro and Liz Garofalo are going to be uh, looking into whether or not the samurai wasp is established in Massachusetts, and that's thanks to some grant funding through the Mass Department of Agricultural Resources, so we're very excited about that. So stay tuned, and that, that research is ongoing. Um, let's see here, another question for you, Jen. Oh, this one they said got answered. Sorry, I just have to skip. Um, Goodness. Oh, from Dan. This is for um, box tree moth. Blackberry, Pachysandra, and Catbriar are noted potential host plants for box tree moth. Can you comment on the sources of that information and whether box tree moth larvae have been observed to feed and complete their life cycle on these hosts? I was not able to get that level of information for those which is why when i presented that slide i moved them to like the potential host range section because we this happens with any pest that we are concerned about right the information that comes out at the beginning tends to morph like i was talking about this at another presentation i gave yesterday about spotted lanternfly when we first put our outreach out it, it, we were like, it attacks pine because we were told it attacks pine, but it doesn't, it's not really thought to attack pine. Um, so I could dig up the references for you outside of this session if you need them, but I don't have them at hand and they weren't, um, they weren't specific. Like there's, I don't know if there's a, a nice peer reviewed paper out there like there is now for spotted lanternfly where they tested everything and documented what life stages were found and whether it completed its life cycle. I have a feeling it's gonna turn out that these are sort of like, I don't even know if calling them host is the right thing. It just, it's something that they could use to feed on, 
and which means that it would be a way that they could kind of survive if you are treating just the boxwoods, but I don't know if they could complete their life cycle on them or not. Sorry, I don't have more information. This is sort of a, I mean, it's, this is the, the newest pest that we're currently dealing with in this state. Thank you, Jen. Oh, that's helpful. And Dan plans to contact you directly. Let's see here. Okay. Um, a question about brown marmorated stink bug. Could you show the pictures of the stink bug again and explain the brown fan at the base? Um, if it doesn't have that brown fan, is it one of the lookalikes? Oh, right. Those are the wings. Those are just the folded up wings. Hold on. I'm not sure what the best picture would be to show you. Also, you're going to have to look. Can I still share my screen? I'll um, hold on. I can take it back and give it back to you. Let's see. I don't know what this thing. I got to get to the right slide. All right. And here comes the invitation to share. I don't think it's the there. Can you do you? Well, it doesn't even matter if you can see my other slides. Is this the the slide with the life stages? Yes. That you can see? Okay, cool. All right. Um, but yeah, so this this diamond at the bottom is basically the exposed folded up wings, and it's dark black on brown marmorated stink bug. And I think. If I show you the lookalikes, notice on the spine shoulder bug here, it's white, but then there's this wee little black dash there. And notice how it's sort of brown on the Eucystis species. And on the Podesis, it's, it's, um, it looks orange, but it's actually translucent versus on marmor marmorated stink bug where it's black. I hope that helps. Getting comments that folks are saying great slides and it's very helpful. So <laughs> thank you. Let's great see slides here. when they're not cut off at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry again about that. Um, let me see if I can fit in one or two more questions here. Brown marmorated stink bug. Can praying man mantis? Oh goodness, can mantids? I'll just say that. Uh, can mantids be used to protect uh, crops from them? I. That is a whole other discussion that we would have to have outside of this webinar because we don't have any native mantids in Massachusetts so I do not advise that people release them or encourage them they are fierce predators <laughs> so yeah I I mean I suppose they would eat some of them I doubt they're going to eat enough of them to take them populations down I mean, I see them eat lantern flies and pictures from Pennsylvania, but again, um, any mantids that you're seeing in Massachusetts are introduced. They're, yeah, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> nope, I think that's that's helpful, and I'll just comment that in general, the predators usually tend to be oversaturated by um, prey, such as an invasive insect that's very well widespread. So usually the predators, although helpful in the right scenario, um, aren't, aren't the ones that drop the population significantly. And that's a very generalized comment, but. Um, that's the answer I wish I gave. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, yours was very helpful. I just get too excited about this stuff, as I think you said, fellow bug nerd and wanted to <laughs> throw that out. Um, no, that's, I mean, it's true. We've never effectively managed um, an insect by releasing a predator. You know, the parasitoids do a better job of that. And of course, there's always exceptions to every general rule, as I'm constantly reminded in the insect world. Let's see, one last question, maybe about brown marmorated stink bug removal. Um, uh, the question was, can stink bugs survive flushing down the toilet? Um, do you want to comment on that and perhaps other methods of folks uh, cleaning them up in their homes? Um, okay, I don't know if any official scientific testing has been done on that. Um, I will tell you what I do and what I tell people to do. I tell people to freeze them for at least 24 hours and then you could just dump them outside or you could dump them in the trash. 
Um, you know, it, I, I try not to flush things because I'm trying to conserve water. That's just my own personal feelings about stuff like that. The only other, I mean, I, I doubt they would survive. Um, and certainly they wouldn't be in a, if they did manage to survive until they got into the sewer system, they wouldn't be in a hospitable environment to, to continue their life cycle. They wouldn't have any food or any place to lay eggs. Um, the only thing I will say is that if you are going to start putting bugs in your freezer to warn the other people in your house <laughs> that you're doing that so that they don't freak out when they open the freezer and see a bottle full of dead stink bugs, that's just, again, my own personal experience with that. <laughs> Eventually, they'll get used to it, though. <laughs> you think, <laughs> but after 20 years, no. <laughs> Well, thank you, Jen. Um, I, we're running out of time here, so I, I want to um, finish up and give folks the instructions that they need for their credits. But thank you again so very much for sharing all of this information with us today. Thank you for having me.